Hello, everyone. I'm Hans Engel from the Directors Guild of Canada. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to DGC Visionaries 2021, where we celebrate DGC filmmakers' work at all the major film festivals across Canada. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional Indigenous lands that we all live and gather on today. Although this event is online and takes place at many locations, we each enjoy the privilege of living and working within an Indigenous territory. As a gesture of appreciation for our use of these lands, we ask that you join us in acknowledging the people who have lived and thrived in these regions across the continent for tens of thousands of years. We're very fortunate to have renowned DGC director Shane Belcourt as our moderator. Shane is an award-winning and two-time CSA-nominated Métis DGC filmmaker. Notable work includes the feature film Tecoronto, shorts such as A Common Experience, and the dramatic feature Red Rover, where he was the co-writer and director. He's an alumna of the TIFF Talent Lab and NSI's uh, Totally Television programs. Our featured director tonight is Breton Hannum, whose new film Wildhood is at TIFF, Finn, Imaginative, and no doubt many more festivals this year. They are a two-spirit Lanou filmmaker living in Nova Scotia, where they were raised. Their films deal with themes of community, culture, and language, with a focus on two-spirit and LGBTQ plus identity. They co-wrote the short Champagne, which premiered at TIFF, and wrote, directed North Mountain, a two-spirit thriller that won Best Original Score at the Atlantic Film Festival and the Nova, uh, Screen Nova Scotia Award for Best Feature. They also wrote and directed the short film Wildfire, which premiered at BFI Flair and went on to play at Frameline LGBT Film Festival, as well as VIF in Vancouver, Imaginative and Inside Out LGBT Film Festival. Breton is a fellow of the Praxis Center for Screenwriters, Outfest Screenwriting Lab, Whistler's Indigenous Filmmaker Fellowship, and the CFC Writers Lab. Welcome, Breton and Shane. Come on in. <laughs> we just had, we had we had to throw in the applause. We just had to do it. We had to do it. Welcome, guys. Great to have you here. Um, now, before I turn it over to you, just want to point out to those tuning in the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. That's where you can type in your questions. Shane will, will be keeping an eye out and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Throw them in there as you think of them. Um, and he'll get to them at some point throughout the conversation. And a reminder too, that you can choose your screen settings with a view button in the top right hand corner. Um, that's it for me. Really looking forward to this conversation. It's an incredible film. Um, over to you guys and uh, have a great conversation and see you at the end. Thank you very much, Hans. Thanks. And hello, Breton, how are you, my friend? Uh, this is super, super, super thrilling um, to be, uh, you know, having this opportunity to speak to you at this time when your movie is about to make a world premiere at TIFF. And I can't believe this is <laughs> this is so kind of surreal in a way, because <laughs> there we were at the last TIFF when people were allowed to go to it, I guess a couple of years ago, we went out for coffee and you were telling me about uh, getting ready to shoot this movie. And here we are, a world premiere, and it's already uh, pre-sold. And I couldn't be more thrilled for you. I couldn't be more honored to have this chance to speak to you about this really beautiful film. Thanks, for, thanks so much for having me on with this man to chat with you. Yeah, I'm I'm happy that we have a chance to to talk. It's been a while actually since we're able to talk, um, and hopefully we can meet up in person um, sooner rather than later. Uh, and not have 40 years pass like they just did. <laughs> I got a little more gray today. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I will get a chance to sort of show a clip and sort of get people a, a sense of, of what the film is, um, uh, Wildhood, that, uh, that we're gonna be speaking about today. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, let folks know that, uh, you know, this, I, I got a chance to meet you in a writing room on a TV show. Um, and I was so blown away by your composure, your kindness, your generosity, your humor. 
uh, and just your your nature of just a of a steady, beautiful person. And it in the film Wildhood, it, I, I've seen, of course, I've seen the rough edit, and that was a you know that's a process. But to see this finished work, your your beautiful centeredness really comes across in this work, and uh, it's a beautiful film. So for anybody who hasn't seen it, uh, get your tickets, line up, find a way. It's it's just one of those beautiful films that you get a chance to see in your life. It's one of those great, beautiful works. And it, it's a hell of a film. I mean, well done. It's probably like the best compliment I've, <laughs> I've ever gotten in my life. So thanks. I'm probably <laughs> going to be blushing the rest of this time now. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you just quickly. I mean, so this is the, the DGC chat, right? So, you know, you're, there, it might be at times short on story and the sort of the reason why you made the film and the themes and that kind of stuff and more on the process, what it's like to work as a director. I'm like, how, I want to know how you pulled the pieces together to make this film. So now you and I are having brunch. You now I'm not asking girl, you know, how'd you get this? How'd you get that? Um, but now if you could just remind everybody, because I know a little bit about the story, about you made the short film, then there was a successful pitch at, uh, at the TEF festival, and then you put the financing together and here we are in the feature. But what I wanted to know was, because actually I never asked you last time we met, was did you make the short with the feature in your back pocket, knowing I just got to make the short to raise the money? Or did you make the short and go, oh, you know what? And, and the short being wildfire, this feature of Wild Hood. Um, did you make Wildfire with the feature in mind or was it just something that, oh, you know what? I, that was so much fun with those characters in that world. I want to make a feature out of this. It's a, a maybe it's a little bit unorthodox way that, that it evolved, but I was working on the script for like 10 years, um, you know, off and on in development. Uh, and then as we we're kind of getting to the stage where it's like, this might be a film, this feature might be a film. Um, it was kind of turned into a short drawing from a whole feature script. So there was a lot of stuff to draw on. There's a lot of different ways that it could have gone. Um, like we could have just picked a scene or like one moment, but instead we made this little microcosm um that's kind of more of like an appetizer than a than an entree uh and really i mean part of it was you know to like show people um what the story was and and to to hopefully secure funding and things like that but the other part of it was to figure out the creative process of how we were going to approach the the visuals the how we're going to film out in the land how are we going to support the team um you know and how, how how much resources did we need to be able to realistically do this because we ended up filming the feature as well as the short uh way outside of the central zone like outside of Halifax which is like our hub right so we're not really near any equipment places or places that can service lenses or cameras so what we got is what we got and if something you know flubs or goes wrong or Oh, I wish we had a an enormous 18k light. I don't know why I don't use those really, um, but uh, then they're not there. They're not just like, oh, we'll run and grab one. It's like three hours out and three hours back type thing, or, or no, three hours there and back. It's not that that big of a problem. <laughs> um, so that was kind of how that that um, developed, and it was like also testing out how we as a team, uh, like the team, would work together. And, you know, do we need an art department? Yes, yes, you do need an art department. You need, it turns out, uh, a good amount of support to be able to go out in the middle of nowhere. Or I guess the inverse would be like, you need one person and then you're, that's gonna be your life for the next five years. Um, so that's kind of how that, uh, how wildfire originated. Um, so it was a bit of a luxurious place to be in because, there's 90 pages to to pick and choose from. What did you learn from Wildfire? Like, what, like after you made Wildfire, you now now you know. Okay, well, this is gonna work because the short worked. So we're gonna go make a feature out of it. But what were you going? You, you you wanted to test run it? Were you sort of like, oh, you know what? 
these areas are going to be major problems and these are going to be my successes. Yeah, well, a big part of it, and it's something that I always try to do is, is to film out on the land because it's kind of central to my upbringing and identity um, and central to language and culture. So that's something I always try to do. Um, and that's something that was a big component of doing the short was like, how, how much room do we have to explore and just let things be in the moment? You know, we scouted some locations beforehand um, when those locations don't work out because farmers don't want you to burn their fields, it turns out they don't like that. Um, <laughs> then what, what do you do? Like, what can you do? So there's a bit of problem solving kind of on the fly. Uh, so that was a big thing to learn that you can have a plan. It's good to have a plan. Let's have a plan. Let's make a plan. But let's also be ready to let go of the plan and see what the location is going to give us. Or if, if we lose a location, then, you know, what what can we do? How can we problem solve? So it was kind of embracing those to be able to embrace those mistakes or different parts of performances that would come out from being in different spaces because they all these different spaces, these different pieces of land have different vibes to them. Um, and it was clear that sometimes there's just going to be cars <laughs> or airplanes or chainsaws. Um, so definitely flagged that. Um, as we we're moving forward and also the trade-off of like we're going to go in the middle of the woods we're going to go way in the middle of the woods like drive an hour on a back road that's it's an hour for a seven kilometer drive <laughs> just because the road doesn't exist really um, that you you're kind of sacrificing uh, you know camera time <laughs> Uh, but to know when that is important to do um, and when it's just kind of like, oh, no, we got to we got to bail on this. <laughs> or there'll be a, it'll be a five minute feature, <laughs> which is not a feature. And, and after you made the short, did that get you into a writing mind of what you just described of, you know, you know, some scenes might not be necessary locations. Did you, did you do a repolish on the whole draft? Like, oh, you know, now that I've experienced this, here's how to tighten it up and really focus it and put it in more of right in the, you know, the zone where you could hit it out of the park. Was that something that you went through? Yeah, there was kind of like stepping back after finishing that and doing the pitch too at TIFF, which was, you know, I, I'm not a public speaker and there's, it turns out that was a very, public thing um so i'm always being challenged that's good um but stepping back from that situation and going back um into the story and into the script and saying let's apply like all these things um that kind of came out other other like what you said you know maybe the scene isn't necessary or this we could get away without this um, character even sometimes it would there was a lot of shifting around like that or there was you know what's really nice is if you know we have these scenes and we have these dialogues and what I what I tend to do is I write a lot of I write a lot um, especially of dialogue with the mind that I'm probably going to cut a lot of it out and then sometimes you go too far and people are like now there's no dialogue and we don't know what's happening and then you put in like a drop back and you're like, then you're good you're okay <laughs> it's like a zen approach to you know the script and the dialogue yeah. one stroke <laughs> the right stroke <laughs> <laughs> yo um okay so it, with the, let's I, i'm curious now too because i felt that the performers in the short film uh wildfire were all great and there's one carryover uh the, the character if i'm correct right it's the uh, travis character by avery winters anthony yes but the other two, the character of Link and Pasme, the two leads, Link being the main lead, um, those were new finds. And it, to your, to the, to when I mean, you remounted the film, and I guess I, I you know, I really just want to note that the feature is all the performances are great. You know, like there's not a moment where I'm like, oh, this is a lot of sour notes, but it, it's just played perfectly by everybody. I mean, it has Michael Gray eyes, you know, for a, one of the little sequences on the road trip. So it's 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 star studded. It's beautiful. But the the young performer, um, I just make sure I got that Philip Lewitsky. Yeah, yeah, Philip Lewitsky, and the title character of Link. Uh, wow, 
how did you come in contact? What was the casting process like? Was it a piece of cake, one email, it's in, you're done, and you're shooting? And from that, also with the casting, you know you have the young performer playing Travis, one of the characters of this three, you know, three teens on the, you know, on the move across this road trip movie. You know, what, did you... Did you get people in the same room together? How much rehearsals did you have in pre-production? As a director, like, I'm just curious, how did you cast it? And how did you get them to be, become these characters so perfectly? We uh, didn't do anything. It just all happened and uh, naturally, and it was perfect, the end. Uh, I, wish, yeah, I wish that it would happen like that. I mean, no, I don't, because it, I enjoy the process of, of how those things happen and unfold. Um, so, uh going back to Avery we found Avery um when we went to a gym that my uh friend owns and, and he does stunt work and he was like whoa what are you guys doing we're shooting short uh, we're looking for like actors um you know young kid this age and he's like why don't you look over there there's like you know that 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 kid's like really interested in acting I think he was there with his dad so we went over and chatted a bit and he came on uh, in on auditioned and he was stellar. I think he was like 10 at the time. Um, don't think he had any training. He's, that's just who he is. He's great. It's just us. It's all very natural. Um, and that was awesome. In the, he was awesome in the short. Uh, and our performers in the short, our leads in the short, um, they were non-actors as well. And we, we had searched uh, by going to different communities for many weeks um, to find them. And the goal was to cast just teenagers that were those characters um and so after the short we kind of sat down with them and worked with them uh to see kind of like how comfortable they were um what time did they have and things like that and ultimately decided that like they still needed to be included and we had a place for them and they're they're near the end of the movie i won't go too much into that but so they were included as well it was very important that we still include them um and then we started searching for uh, our leads for the feature. And this was pre-COVID, uh, but we still were doing everything by tape and Zoom. So, you know, we got some tapes from some people and then there were a couple of times we were able to do auditions like this over Zoom, right? You know, I'm auditioning you right now, Shane, for the role of moderator. And you're doing pretty good. Um, so, <laughs> That was a, a cool thing to be able to do from a distance and say, okay, you know, these guys are really good. You know, Philip is stellar and uh, Buzz and I, uh, Joshua uh, Ojek plays Buzz and I, and, you know, amazing, amazingly talented as well. I was like, these guys are great together, or are great apart, but let's bring them together and see if they hate each other uh, or not, because, you know, that, that might be important. Uh, um, and it just so happened that I think they were either in, maybe they were both in Toronto or maybe they might've been both in Ottawa at the same time. And they were able to come in. Um, and to, so they were together on one end of the screen and I was on the other end of the screen uh, and we ran some scenes and it was like, okay, no, there's really something there between them, this chemistry between them. And then kind of talking to them a little bit about the characters and their own lives and their own experiences, how they relate to the material. And then knowing kind of having worked with Avery um, before, I was like, okay, I can kind of see how these three will, I can see how this dynamic is gonna happen. Um, I have an idea anyway, of maybe three different ways it could go and hopefully it, it, it goes in a good way. Um, and then when they finally got to meet each other all in person, it was like a couple of days before uh, we went to camera um, because uh, they were quarantining. They had to come, they had to fly in from away. Uh, so they had two weeks of quarantine and I was like, oh, I wanted two weeks of rehearsal. So we just did everything on Zoom. Uh, and there were, we had an acting coach, uh, Claudia, Yurt, uh, Claudia Yurt was there and she was working with everyone and, and we're just kind of like doing the scenes and working the scenes and digging into the material for like two weeks so committed all of them uh you know and i would tune in and do some stuff do some work with them and then i would kind of like go do other things and talk to you know our cinematographer or production designers 
And then I check back and they'd be like, look at this thing that we discovered with these characters. And then they present this scene in a whole new way. And it's like, wow, okay, that's super cool. That's more than I could have could have hoped for. Um, and then we did a couple of days of, of in-person stuff too. Uh, and then they, they continued to work, you know, after like we wrapped, they would go home and eat stuff and then keep rehearsing. Like they were in the, in the zone. So that was just a dream come true as far as, I've never had that much rehearsal time before. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. You know, I, I just, I, I might've skipped a beat here in our present, I, I might've failed in the audition of the moderator. Let me walk it back just real quick, okay? Just, okay, just sort of realize that right, um, the, the trailer part. I was, um, I was curious about the transition, but of the short to the feature. Okay, so now we're gonna talk, now we're in the, we're locking and loading in the wild of the feature. And at this point, I want, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll just read, I gotta pull my glasses out for those, uh, the, the quick synopsis, and then we'll show a clip to give you a flavor of, of the kind of the tonal range that, the, that I think the film is. It's a great clip for that. So uh, it says here, um, Wildhood is a film about a rebellious, two-spirited teenager who runs away from home to find his birth mother and reclaim his Mi'kmaq heritage. Nice. Um, is there anything else you want to say to sort of set up the clip that Ryan will, will uh, put on for us? No, I, I, I'm not going to interfere. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn my mic and can, uh, video off and then we'll let Ryan uh, take uh, the moment here. Okay. Beautiful. Um, okay, so one thing about anything that uh, that strikes me about that uh, that bit is is just for the audience. If you want to describe, we were talking with these characters of uh, Link, um, uh, Pasme, and Travis. If you just want to let people know what they just saw. Sure. Uh, that's uh, so. Link is the tall blonde guy. And Buzz and I is the dark haired fella. And then the little, little dude is uh, Travis. Uh, so this is kind of like a scene where they're just on the road and it's open and free and things are kind of progressing in a, in a good way. So they're just kind of in the moment and it's uh, a little lighter. In, in moments like this, when when you're are these are they scripted and then hey this is the action line, um, you know, there you play with the the tall grass and throw it or is it like literally just hey guys have some fun, we're gonna you know you're gonna have to work with your DP and we're gonna sort of follow around and sort of pick up some moments like, yeah I mean I write I like write something but it's not that it's not uh, not that at all and I know it's not gonna be that. Uh, it's more of a, the writing in the script is a bookmark. Uh, I have all these images and they're, none of them are on, <laughs> none of them make it onto the, <laughs> the final version, which is totally fine. Um, because it's more going into the space and finding this awesome space and then just saying, okay, guys walk that way. Uh, or guy, our, our cinematographer, the guy Godfrey might be like, this is the best direction for the sun or whatever, you know, he's just gonna follow, he's just gonna follow them. And then my direction is just kind of like, go go for it. <laughs> mm. And then we, we tweak out as we go. Um, but, you know, I don't tell them to like pick up those weeds and 
sword fight with them. Like, it's just kind of like, they know they're in the characters by that point. Um, I don't remember when we shot the, what the order was, but so it's kind of like a little bit of mix of both. I tend to rely on more of that collaboration on the day than, than my word that I write. That's just, that's, that's a suggestion. And when, when you're working in that, you were earlier, we we're talking about getting those three young performers and the two leads were really kind of meeting up together and doing a lot of that character work and also with an acting coach. Um, what was the, what, how did you sort of engage with them in terms of like finding their rooting in their character? Was it, you know, you present a backstory to them or they present a backstory and you say, you know, what, how did you get them to that place? Because it, it, the movie to me really rides on if These kids are off at any moment. This thing's going to fall apart. And they, you know, so much of it is like those, it's not just like music scenes, people walk around, but it's, it's, it's all these, as you describe these unspoken things, these moments where people want to say something, you want them to say something and they're not getting it out and, and there's so much beautiful tension and so when the release finally comes it's everything's so understated that you've done so I'm just wondering how did you get them into that place are you like are you line reading are you biography like how is you to director get each of those actors to where they needed to be I I don't do I don't do any of those things um I have a backstory I have a lot of information I spend a lot of time with the characters I do a lot of character work then I don't share any of it. Um, instead, I will. I talk to the actors about um, how they relate to the character, how they see the character, and I. What I kind of encourage more is for them to ask me questions, or to tell me things that they discover by doing work with the character or being with the character. And occasionally, sometimes it might be, uh, let's guide this exploration slightly over here to a different area to focus on um but i tend to not dictate or i don't interfere as i try to interfere as le least as possible as less as possible least as possible um just because i think what by giving the character over to these actors you know it's a huge amount of trust in both directions um but that's where those moments come alive is by giving them over to them uh, and then in the scene you know the direction that I give uh, is not too much I never do line reads uh, well I won't say never I'll, that's a tool you can use if you have to piss someone off <laughs> or, <laughs> or sometimes you just need to like get that one little bit and it's it, that's but tend to not do that um, but I what I do also when I give direction is I don't give the direction i'll ask a question would would link do this do you think he would say this do you think he's in a place um where he would be telling someone this or admit to this or what feelings um is this character feeling right now uh and so sometimes they'll answer me uh and sometimes i'll say i don't want an answer i just want you to you know think about think about it uh and sometimes it goes terribly wrong but that's just that's how it works um but often than not more often than not even if it goes off base the places that it goes are interesting uh and sometimes they're way more interesting than than what i imagined um so it becomes a, a matter of seeing that come alive and then letting go of the of the preconceived notions i guess and saying, let's embrace this and follow the flow of this um, and see where it goes. Very seldom is, is it kind of like, this is totally not working and I don't know what to do. And if I get in a situation like that, I have no problem saying that. I don't know how to approach this. And I'll turn to Guy or you know um, the actors or the people around me that are experienced and say, what how should how do you guys think we should do this or what do you think is the best approach and suggestions come from different direct different directions and then we kind of sit and say okay no all right let's do it like this this will give us the best path usually usually it's okay when you're whether it's rehearsing you're seeing what they're doing or you're on set and you're watching through the monitor beside the camera actually that's a quick question do you stand beside the monitor uh, is you say beside the camera operator or are you like in video village somewhere with a bullhorn 
<laughs> I tend to stand by the camera. Sometimes I don't even look at the frame. Um, hmm. I might check the frame and just see, okay, this looks awesome. And then guy knows what he's doing. So hmm. I trust, I trust his vision, his eye, and he gets it. He gets it. So then I know I can step away if I need to, to p focus entirely on the actors and just understand what's happening in the scene and what's not happening in the scene, right? And mm. to see like all these different little currents that are going on and be like, oh, I know if I go up to him and I pull this one little string, it's gonna piss him off. And that's gonna take the scene into a, a deeper place. So then I might go up and I might pull that little string by saying one little thing and then, you know, letting, letting it fly. <laughs> It's a little weird. <laughs> the night before, are you like sort of going through your script and putting like motivations or what you want, like beside the, you know, the subtext next to the text and like a sort of an acting binder. So you're, you're sort of arming yourself or you just walk in and sort of just be like, let's see what happens. Then I'll respond to the moment. I'm not, I'm not that, I'm not that brave that I just walk in. <laughs> oh my God. No, uh, I, I do prep. I do prep. I do my homework. Um, so what I do is I go through the whole script uh, before we begin. I go through the whole thing. It's all very marked up and color coded, and there's like tons of scribbles and notes on it. And then I get super mad when I have to rewrite something because I have to pull those pages out. <laughs> um, but that's just how it goes. But uh, and then I will set that there, and I trust that I I know the material. And I I've studied my, that and I've done my homework. So I might before the night before. Um, look, okay, we have these scenes up and I'll read over my notes and I'll be like, oh, no, no, this is off base now because of things that we've done um, in scenes previous, right? And it's, which is a bit hard because it's all out of order because um, they never let you shoot in order. Uh, <laughs> but there's, I, I do refer back to my notes and see, uh, and I have the notebook, I always have my notebook uh, with me on set. I opened it, I think, five or six times um, hmm. and that was more for for clarity and to double check and be sure oh if we change this performance or the vibe in this part how does it impact this that we're going to shoot in a week uh, hmm. that kind of stuff uh, but because of that um, and because the actors have done their their work usually it would be stepping on the set and then saying, um, let's just go. And they'll, they'll show me what they've done. And then I just, I'm like, all right, they already hit most of it anyway. Uh, You're filming and, this, like when you say, let's go, the camera's rolling. Yeah, right. we just, we okay. just go. We might, we might run through it for blocking more than anything, or maybe where the camera's gonna land, you know, little things like that. Performance, usually pretty good. Uh, that we would just kind of go and see what happened. And then we'd adjust a little bit, adjust, adjust a little bit, you know, three or four takes. Um, not too many. There's only one or two times that we went way over because, you know, a car goes by, there's suddenly a sheep. Mm. I don't know, like random things happen. Um, but because I have that kind of notebook, it's always in my back pocket. It's I guess more psychological than, well, it has many functions, right? But mm. uh, I'm able to know that it's there if I absolutely need it, but it also gives me the freedom to move forward in new, in new ways and not kind of like worry about, is this angry enough or sad mm. or, or, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, because the like I said, the performances are so great, and they're also like you know, in some cases, younger actors that are doing them. That's why I'm sort of like really trying to pick your brain on how you got there, because you know, it wasn't like oh well, you know, you're a professional, so <laughs> floor is yours. So it's, it's amazing that you know what you're able to uh, accomplish in these performances, working with their their talents and your talents coming together. And one piece of that too, I'm sure, must have been tricky, is uh, you know, speaking the Mi'kmaq language throughout the project. You know, that was one of the things that I remember so clearly when I first met you was, you know, you're on a journey and a road of uh, reclaiming your language and becoming a fluent speaker. And it's so inspiring and beautiful. And to put that into this work and to put that on set with the, you know, could you just speak about sort of the idea to put that into the film, that element of a character reclaiming Mi'kmaq heritage 
over the course of this story. But at the same time, you know, you have to now find a way to get that language out of the character, out of the actor's mouths. Yeah, the, it was it was a very important thing that the that the language was always part of it, even in the in the short version of it. Right, we still had the line, we had the language kind of there, and we have language more present in in the feature. Um, and then working with a lot of the collaboration for for that came with, or well, all of the collaboration came from um, John Silliboy, who is at the who is a co-founder of the Wabanagi Two Spirit Alliance. Um, so I had written the script, and I know enough of the language to know that I don't know anything. Um, I would love to be fluent one day. I don't know if that's possible, but I continue to strive and work. But uh, so we would sit down and say, "Here are the lines in English," um, and they are written in a way that I prepared for translation knowing how some things might translate and then other things I have absolutely no idea like it's things are quite literal right I think there was one line that we had that was like go to sleep a little mouse or something like that and John blasts and he's like you can't really say you can say that but you're saying it to a literal mouse um you know it is what it is so it's like okay well we can't do that we have to what would you say and then you know John would give a couple options um, and then we would record the language and write out the pronunciations. Um, and then when the actors came, like they had access to all these, these uh, files and pronunciations. And then uh, John was able to kind of work with them uh, in person to kind of work on how the nuance of, of some of the, some words are very tricky, right? Um, it can be difficult. And you know, it's things are aren't perfect. It's like, uh, but we we reached a level where it's like, this is coming across and it's included and it's important uh, that it be there. It's understandable. Uh, it's clear. Uh, so that was uh, that part of it. But, you know, I think that's to me, it's it's very important because you know the language comes from from the land. You know, the animals, uh, the plants. Like those are our first teachers, and you know they're they're where everything springs from. It's where we come from. Uh, so to be able to speak the language that reflects those worldviews uh, and cultural elements, like that alone, even if it's just one word, even if it's just you know thank you or hello or you know what's up, um, you know that I think is is has a power to it in it, in itself. Um, and I know when I listen to it, it makes me feel good um and then as a bonus we were able to work with um some people here tom and caroline johnson in eskasoni first nation to create a dub uh, in all in a language the whole thing is in Mi'kmaq, like, which is amazing to be able to do that uh and that's super super exciting um, we had one question on the uh, Q and A. It, it's it, it's about uh, the same kind of getting performances. Did you do a table read by Zoom or in person when you did it? If you did a table read, did we do a table read? You know, I don't remember. I don't think we did a table read. Um, I don't think we did one. I could be. You lying. never had a chance to hear it back to hear the whole thing all the way through, or you just you just hit play on Final Draft. And just like let the the automation. Oh, the robot. Yeah, the robot voices. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to creep yourself out, that's something you can do at midnight. Um, no, I, I don't think we. I could be completely wrong because it's been a while and there's been mm. so much going on in the world. But uh, usually, I like to do a table read if it's possible. But because we were no, I think we did read through some parts parts of it and it was by zoom um mm -hmm. you know when Ma when michael was he here michael was also quarantining um and so everything was pretty much done by zoom um yeah i vaguely have a recollection um question person i maybe that's not a super satisfying answer but <laughs> i have one last casting bit and then i just i want to transition over to another element of the production that i'm so curious about and that was uh Elzebeth? Am I getting that character name? I know I thought of her as grandma when I was watching her, but Elzebeth, you know, yeah. 
Elsabeth, and first time performer, I think, in Becky Julian. Yeah. Um, uh, that, other... She was mesmerizing yeah. every scene. I'm like, <laughs> wow, she's a brilliant performer. She's, uh, that's just Becky, Elder Becky Julian. Um, it's very intimidating to have an elder on set because how in the world could you ever presume to give direction to an elder? Um, I personally think it's impossible. Um, and yeah, there, Becky had, has no you know, formal training or experience, uh, those kind of things, and did all her tr translations just on her own because she knows mm -hmm. the language and she just can speak. And I was like, I'm just, you're gonna do what you do and we're gonna film what you do um and my direction was basically do you want some tea do you need a drink of water um or can you do this two more times and then we'll take like a five minute break a 10 minute break or like <laughs> you know that that's really it uh amazing uh, just amazing person a beautiful person um you know and she's super just that she's that that what what is on the screen is is who she is she's just so comfortable in herself and, and the world. And she has that, I don't know, elder quality, uh, did, comments. Um, did you have a relationship with uh, uh, your this elder prior to, were you seeking um, you know, advice and ceremony with her over many years? Or was it just someone how you had started to make a film and then that led to your discovery of Becky? Um, we had originally, I, I know a different elder that was going to be in this role and, and was unable to uh, be in this role. Um, and we had met Becky doing a, working on a TV show a couple of years before or a year before called Spirit Talker, which is working with uh, a spirit, spirit talker, um, Sean Leonard. Um, so we were in different communities. And one of the communities that we went to was um, Sebega Nagadi, uh, uh, Shubi, uh, uh, Shubana, Shubanakadi. It's a weird to say it like that, First Nation. Um, and Becky was, does a basket weaving. She's a basket maker and she does wooden flowers um, and is just kind of like a general, lovely, amazing person. So, I think the first time I met Becky was then, and it was up the road, they were making, you know, big mod tacos. So it was like, can you go up the road and bring these, bring these tacos over, over down the road to the, like, and like, oh, I was like, totally sure. I would love to be able to bring this food um, to an elder and uh, made up, you know, a couple of plates and, and brought them over uh, and chatted a little bit. But so, it wasn't the first time we had met um, on set, uh, but really we talked a little bit about the script and, and what, it, what it meant. Um, and then a different, a couple of days uh, later, she was just teaching us and sharing knowledge about plants, um, which are harvested uh, in the film actually near the end. Uh, and what they do and what they're for and how to prepare them. Um, and then, you know, at lunch times, it was just listening to stories, which is amazing. Uh, so it was a big uh, treat, very, very honored to be able to work with Becky and have her on set. And then her words are just so amazing. Like when she speaks a language, it's so beautiful to hear. And then, She's speaking uh, Mi'kmaq and then English and moving quite fluidly between them. And that that's done, uh, that's something, how, it's how you teach people, right? Um, and just some of the stuff, she's just kind of does what she wants and says what she wants. And I was like, I can only, only understand maybe one or two words here and there. Um, and then the English version is just kind of whatever her message she wants to say. And just kind of like, hmm. I'm not, I'm just gonna sit back and, you know, wow. let this let this unfold. And then seeing her with uh, Philip too, and just kind of like, 
he's very quiet and he's very, you know, he's listening. Uh, and that's just kind of like, was like, wow, I feel super, you know, calm and good after filming <laughs> that scene. Wow. Well, great way to just sort of, you know, understand the space and your role in it, in that relationship. You know, I wanted to ask now if we can just switch a little bit now to the, sort of the camera elements, you know, of directing, you know, it, um, obviously there's great talent here from you on that without, without question. And when I was, you know, you had the pleasure of working with one, I think one of the great Canadian cinematographers, Catherine Lutz in the short film, Wildfire. And I think because of the scheduling, she wasn't able to do the feature Wild Hood. And so then you wound up, oh, one of the great Canadian cinematographers, a guy Godfrey. Um, what was the relationship? What, what was it sort of like, I want to make a film that's going to be handheld where you get to sort of paint with the camera. Here's your, you know, you're operating, you go. Or is it like, how did you first sort of, I know you're going to talk about the script and the story is going to buy into that world, but how did you get into sort of a working relationship with someone who's so like his resume is ridiculously, you know, astute and astounding and his work is beautiful. What was that like for you? Uh, that was, I've never experienced a, a collaboration quite on the level like that. Working with both of them, um, both Catherine and Guy is, was like amazing. Um, but yeah, because of scheduling, Catherine was unable to, to, to join us on the feature. Um, so hopefully one day I get to work with <laughs> um, again uh that was a, a great experience and then working with guy is a very different experience but uh, is equally as you know rewarding and just totally interesting um you know guy read the script we went over things about the story and different aspects of it and then just kind of talked about like different aspects or elements uh, um you know of what what the story needed or wanted uh, and kind of what he was bringing to the table was stuff that I was, I was on board with everything. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't make a concrete, super concrete shot list, super concrete storyboard, which is something I've done mostly in the past, um, is like, it's an Excel sheet. There's shots, you get the shots, you move on, you know, so that hierarchical process wasn't really at the center of this relationship. It was more um, based on intuition and feeling. Um, it was funny because uh, I would the action would be called and then there'd be a couple seconds where like not a lot was happening and then suddenly things would happen and then it would be cut and then there was still kind of camera rolling, right? And so I was like, oh, I noticed you're, you know, capturing these moments before we begin and kind of after we end that we can take and he's like yeah there's like these great little moments that can happen I was like that's cool because before you know when frame is called I give like a five count before I call action just to see so then on top of that he's also building in like his own <laughs> count so there's like 10 seconds of like people are like what's going on and then things would start um <laughs> And then also just kind of was like, you know, total, total trust in, in, you know, guys experience and, and how he understood the material. Uh, and just like, if you see something that's great, just film it, right. Just film it. Like, you know, that was kind of the approach. Um, and as we began to work together more, it was, well, he's just going to, he'll, will be in the scene and the camera will find where it wants to be. So, you know, the shot list may be on a shot list that we have there. It's like, there's two shots, but then we end up with nine shots mm -hmm. um, because the camera is moving and looking in different places and different takes um, to kind of gather as much material, candid material as possible. Uh, and then the other thing too, is like we had a discussion beforehand about um, camera and lenses and equipment and things like that. We only used sticks in one scene. Hmm. Everything else was, it was just incredibly demanding on the poor cinematographer and camera team. <laughs> but uh, because of that, it creates a, a, a feeling that matches the performance, that things are just alive and dynamic and moving and shifting and growing. 
Uh, so there's no kind of like, you must remain here in, and it has to be a wide shot. Uh, it's kind of like the camera will start over here and then move over here and come over here. I'm a little bit slow when it comes to like making sure. So I'm like probably doing this a lot. I'm like the camera's coming from here and then, <laughs> and then we have a shot down here. And guys probably just kind of like standing there waiting. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. Um, but I'm like, oh, I think we have it all. Yes, we have everything in this scene. And he's like, great. Uh, Cause I'm like, we had the three shots we need. And then in post seeing, you know, when working with the editor, he's like, there are 10 shots in this scene. I'm like, oh, geez. <laughs> hmm. What, um, well, one thing I was, I was wondering about too, when did you even mention it now? You had a lot of shots that were sort of, you know, low angle looking up. And I'm, I'm wondering, like, was that, was there a re like you wanted to, uh, the kid in was psychological reason we're in Link's shoes is he's a little boy in him that's trapped that's trying to find his way like, like was it just sort of you know oh I can't control the production design down the street so I'm gonna just start going like there, there, there's times of, of course I've been wondering what the motivation was and and how did you determine like there's so many times when you're starting on one character and someone else is off and then we kind of go over then they float in they sit beside them and we're waiting and we're gonna get the reaction shot like it's it's this beautiful orchestration like a, I mean, I feel like your operator, you know, your DP guy is, is is sort of just playing beautiful music with the performers in these ways. But I'm wondering, like, how much of that are you walking in? Like, here's the I know you spoke before, like with the lights over here. So let's walk this way. But I'm just wondering, like, sort of like, what is what's your place of, oh, well, we got the single here. I want to go OTS on that. And, you know, are you, are, are you just sort of like, let's get one, let let guy play with the actors and then think of the, the pickup coverage after. Yeah, I mean, it would usually be kind of something like that, maybe even not as structured. Uh, it might be kind of like coming into a scene, say that scene where it's totally loose that we saw that clip of, you know, I'm like, I'm far away. I have a little remote monitor and it cuts out after a certain distance. So I'm like running behind these guys and like also moving kind of trying to stay behind the camera as you know and I'm like well these guys are just going to go find the performances and like they're in the care and character I'm not going to you know bust that I'm just going to let them go and then with guy it's like guy just go free <laughs> like mm. you know find these things and he knows what to look for and he he understands that vibe he does hear that music that you know he's the camera is moving around like that uh and then other times it would be a little more structured in that it's like I think we need a two shot or I think we got to stay on him like we got to stay on on him in this and then we'll get that and then there might be a regroup and you know we just kind of like think about what we just did three takes of this and then guy might say do you think we need or should can we get this shot or do you think we should get this shot and I'll be like well very rarely did I say no let's not get the shot like it's like yes let's get that shot um and then also kind of being mindful of <laughs> of our our ad uh keeping things on track uh but sometimes it would be like I think you know we're coming we need to come we need to switch all the way over here and do something different uh, or just be free to be creative as possible you know and there's some stuff that we tried that didn't didn't work out like I tried to play I, I really love keeping things out of focus um, mm. didn't really always work um, <laughs> we did some stuff like that and we didn't end up using an edit for other reasons um, but we tried we experimented we were able to to make to to treat it like art right instead of mm -hmm. of a checklist of shots to get you need Beautiful. a balance a balance between that but Hmm. Some, sometimes you'll just shoot hands for like 20 hours if you're if no one stops you well this being the dgc 
Um, can we talk a little bit about your first AD? This is probably a question you're not going to get on, C on CBCQ, but I think in this environment, I, I, I am actually very curious. Like, how did you work? You know, some sequences, you know, oh, you're walking in the field and you're, you know, it's more about the time and that kind of stuff. But there's a sequence when they're driving in the car. It feels like a wonder if I'm remembering correctly in the back of the truck when they're first making the escape. And then the character Link leans out the side window. I'm like, wow, he's really doing that. And he's throwing the cup. Now, maybe you double the cup when it lands in the other car but that car has to sort of speed around and then come to a skidding stop. Like there's a thing, there's a certain, there are scenes where, or the bar scene is another one where, you know, your first AD is going to be super, it's not just three people in the field walking. Like there's some complicated scenes and sequences. You know, what was your relationship? I see here, I just, from the Drew McLean, McLean? Yeah, McLean. Can you tell me about your relationship with, uh, with Drew McLean and what was that like with your first AD? Good. I mean, you have to trust what the first AD is doing because you're, I mean, you're all on the same team, right? And though the first AD is keeping you on schedule, sometimes in the heat of the, the production, it can seem like this person's breathing down your neck and, you know, geez, I just want them to go away. But I think it's important to always keep in mind that they're doing their job. Their goal is to make this thing too, and to, to make it as good as possible. Um, you know, things can get a little curt and short sometimes, but then afterwards, you know, I always make sure to say like, I'm sorry if I was a little um, short with you, or, you know, maybe I was a little brief in my, you know, yes, no, like, uh, be, but I, I've, I'm just, it's only because I'm focused and I'm trying to do this and I know we're not done, but it's, I'm trying to get it done. And, you know, you just kind of, it's, it's so to have a relationship where you can say that and to treat the other person with respect, I think is important. I think it's important to treat everyone on set with respect, but the AD is so crucial and the AD team is so crucial to um, keeping things running, literally everything running, like the logistics is important. Um, so there has to be a bit of a, a, a balance that's struck between things. You know, that's something else you get tired of hearing and say, everything must be balanced. Um, but it is true, and, and but sometimes it's a bit of a it's a bit of a fight. Um, but usually it's good. There, there's like only one or two times where we went over, or I did an incredibly long take because I was like so invested in what was going on. Uh, I think we did like a 19 minute take at one point, and the stuff that we got out of it was amazing. But then it was also kind of like I feel really bad because we got really good stuff. But then poor Drew, um, it's like everyone, of course, comes to the AD and it's like, why do we just do a 19 minute take? <laughs> um, like sound is tired and everyone's tired and the director is evil. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, it's all about the performance. I'm giving them 19 minutes to find their way. Um, I, I'm wondering if you are doing something that is a little less structured with a, a shot list, you know, uh, how, how was that relationship then? You know, usually that Excel sheet is like, give me the Excel sheet as the first AD. Let's start breaking down how, you know, how much time and then we'll turn around and all that kind of thing. You know, this film seems like it was sort of lit in with four directions in mind, you know, as so you could film any way kind of, you know, without too much of a turnaround. Yeah, there's it's always exceptions to the rule, but where now it's sort of, and if Guy is gonna be, your DP is gonna be filling his way through footage and adding shots, maybe, maybe not. What was that like? Was sort of like every night that you you know the first AD is like I don't know you have four hours to do that scene however you want to do it <laughs> like how did that I go? mean probably there's a lot of swearing behind closed doors <laughs> uh, but there was you know there was a, a shot list it's just that these are the shots that are going to be the maybe the core center and then we're gonna build out from there or sometimes it might say there's two shots but then guys getting like extra shots that you know, I don't even always know. Um, it's just mm. kind of, you know, developing and going. And then there are bigger scenes where there was more structure required. Safety is required, like to the utmost, like leaning out of the, the, the truck like that. Um, you know, we had, we went through like five or six different setups. He had like a vest thing or no, that was one setup. He had like a, um, a harness on and these cables that are like three, thousand pound cables that anchored him in um but that was all one take like we didn't even have to, he just nailed that shot with the cup too which was great oh um, superstar <laughs> so that we did a bunch of takes of it of course it was like five or six takes um but it 
it turned out pretty good each time. It was kind of more like, let's kind of, maybe there's a stray car passing or whatever. It's mm-hmm. like, well, we gotta, can't use that. Um, and then there are other scenes like the bar where, you know, it was amazing to see Drew just like completely come alive. And he's like, you extras over there, these extras over here. And he's like coordinating, <laughs> he's like doing this amazing job. And he's like, what do you think? Should we put in more extras over here? Do you want more extras? And I'm like, uh, can we have more extras? <laughs> what, what are the rules with COVID? And he's like, oh, I can get them there. But let me just rejig all this stuff where they're going. And then like, he's always running that. And he's like, you know, also like, you know, you have 20 minutes left and, you know, so, so it's kind of like, wow, he's just kind of like doing everything. That's super AD. We're going to jump if it's okay. We'll go, we're going to leave the production phase if it's all right. And, and, and if we could get into uh, the post phase, because, you know, obviously you're working, your editor, I'll just check my notes here unless you want to remind me the name, Sean Rikus. Um, now, what was it like to work with your editor? I, if you have a, a film, it is scripted, but it's as you described, there's 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 a really fluidity about the approach. You know, is it that you sit and watch all the footage or like, hey, you watch the heart, you, you, you go through the footage and I'll come back in a month and then we'll, we'll actually start a dialogue. What was your engagement like with your editor, Sean? And what was that process like for you? Uh, it was all remote, which was new because uh sean is in toronto and i'm in the middle of the woods uh in nova scotia um so sean had all the the footage i had so he went through everything i watched everything um sean did an assembly and then sent it and i was like this is almost four hours troll uh (laughs) the magic minute take is intact (laughs) and then the producers are like maybe we shouldn't have like a three and a half hour movie. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess it's fair. Um, Mini series. <laughs> but it was also, you know, there's also a, a stage that you reach in a day too, where it's like, you have an assembly and it's just, it's just puzzle pieces, right? Laid out mm. on the table. And even if the footage is amazing, seeing all those puzzle pieces together, you're like, what a mess. <laughs> like, oh my God. God, what did we do? Uh, and then like, no, no, it's okay. And Sean's like, there's totally like a story in here. There's like so many stories in here. You know, we just have to, <laughs> we have to now decide the shape of the story. Right. Um, you know, what we're going to focus on, what we're going to pay attention to and, and what we are going to cut, um, mm. which was, I, uh, I put on a brave face, <laughs> but I try not to think about it too much because we cut a lot. Well, as you know, you saw you saw a, a rough cut. Uh, mm-hmm. And comparing that to this, there's like a lot that's not there anymore. Just whole storylines that are gone. Um, and they're beautiful storylines, but you can't have mm. a three and a half hour movie <laughs> um, yet. Uh, so <laughs> working with Sean was in- instrumental, instrumental, right? Because not only are we um, we shape, we're shaping the story as we're, and we're discovering the shape of it, what it wants to be, who do we want to spend time with? Like we want to spend time with the main characters more than anyone. Mm. Um, it's that can we then repurpose scenes that are doing other things and mm. move them and shuffle them or split them in two? or like, you know, do all this, these different creative things Uh, because, you know, you're editing, you have finite material, but you have time to recombine it in different ways. And I had worked with Sean on, on, um, on the short as well. And so that we kind of had already worked together. So I kind of knew his vibe and his approach. And I was like, great, Sean will, I'm like, what do you think of doing this? Like, here's a crazy idea. And he'd be like, that's crazy. Let's try it. And then we try it. I'm like, oh, this doesn't work. But you probably knew that. But we know now that it doesn't work. <laughs> um, so it was a great, very open and collaborative process. Uh, there was a How lot long of was the process. How long was it? Did you seven months? Amazing. It's a long time. <laughs> hmm. And at first it was, you know, we would meet like this and we talk about the movie over Zoom. And you know, I would have notes, I'd send notes, or we would just talk about notes and Sean would write them down because uh, my handwriting is awful. 
uh, and Sean will go away for like a week uh, or more and come back and send a, a cut. And then I'd watch it and I'd make notes. So it's like a really prolonged time of, of working like that. It's a little hard because you can't just be in the room and be like, what if we just move that frame a little mm. bit and then bring in this shot? Like we couldn't do that at first. And then we found out a way that that was possible that he could be live streaming his cut as we would go. And, and it would just be literally 12 hours sitting there with a coffee, many coffees and being like, <laughs> oh yeah, this scene was really singing now. It's really working. Let's move to the next scene. Oh, now it changes the scene and we're all right. we screwed ourselves over here. Uh, so then it's kind of like, Let's, what if we flip them? Like, oh, it's totally awesome. What if we flip these? Oh no, let's not do that. Um, or how do we get into this scene or how, like maybe we cut, this is dragging. What if we just drop it? And there was a lot of, let's just cut this out and see if we need it. And a lot of the times it was, we don't need it, but sometimes we want it or sometimes it's important. And other times we had to say goodbye yeah. um, to, to like beautiful, beautiful footage. Well, I mean, the film really sings and it, I mean, it plays so powerfully in that less is more approach, you know, and and it's so funny that, you know, as a writer, you describe yourself early on as less is more, less is more. And then on set, you're sort of like, you know, like, let's let's have a moment where it's less is more making the most out of a small moment in the data room. It's like, wow, it's a total opposite. All these great long 19 minute moments. And you're like, oh, less is more. And I have to get rid of them. <laughs> but okay, you found a balance. Didn't... <laughs> Glad I didn't shoot more. I would we'd have like days of oh, yeah. Uh, so it's yeah. So it was a it was an interesting experience to end up with so much stuff. You know, we didn't cut anything that was just because oh this doesn't work and it's awful. Like all mm. the performances are great. You know, all these scenes are great scenes, and it's just not, well, not what the story always wants to be. There's not always a spot for them. Uh, so then it was like, great, well, now we have to hold our breath and and cut them out and save them on a very special drive and know that they continue to exist on their own. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I, I uh, well, I would say one thing about the edit, because I did see the rough cut and then now this, the, well done. And I love the the new ending, the streamlined ending. That's, oh yeah. yeah, that you landed the ending. I was like, yes, it, it just and you put the Jeremy Dutcher song at the end, and it's just yeah. my my wife was just passing by. She came home, you know, and she came home from work, and she she just watched that scene. She said, "I have goosebumps. I have to watch this movie. This, this is an amazing movie. This is the most, awesome. I'm like this is just the epilogue, you know. This is a so well done on, on doing all that work over seven months. I mean, you really landed it." Good. I'm, I'm glad you think so. I, I was worried you're going to yell at me because I didn't take all your advice. <laughs> I was like, it, it, oh, look, thanks for the notes, Sean. Disregard them all. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, there you go. That, that's good. I'm happy. <laughs> um, now, there's just one lingering question in the Q&A, and I just want to make sure we get, uh, you know, it says, uh, how did you choose your DOP? So, yeah, was it was it a producer new guy, and then that's how you came? Did you, you know, I, I feel like you'd look at his resume and two seconds later, like this guy can shoot handheld beautifully. This is going to be perfect for what your approach is. Like, how did that relationship find its way? Yeah, that was uh, Garrett, who is uh, one of the producers on the project, um, who had reached out to Guy with the script, with the material. Um, and I think he, he reached out, yeah, and with, it's the same kind of similar with Catherine too. We were talking about bringing Catherine on and then she was working on and with an E, I think, at the time when we were scheduled to shoot. Um, but then, you know, looking at all of the work that Guy has done, um, and, you know, he's from here as well. He, he lives in Toronto now or somewhere. He lives somewhere. Um, but, like, he knows the land. He knows the, the landscape and the feel of the place. So it was kind of like, that's great. And then you know, just even talking to him about how he collaborates and how he works. It's like, that's uh, going to be in a line, line with everything. Like, I, you know, this is going to be very nice uh, when you, you know, you, when you talk to people, like we spoke to several DPs um, and it's kind of like this person's reel is awesome. Everyone has awesome reels. It's like everyone does this awesome stuff, but it's more about whose awesome stuff will complement the way uh, this story will unfold. 
Um, and Guy's work was just kind of a natural fit uh, with that. And so we we're just super lucky, um, you know, gave him the, the script uh, to read. And then he's just, just like, yeah, just into the script um, and could see kind of the possibilities for how it could unfold with the shot language and the camera work and, you know, the enormous lighting package called the sun. Um, the, you know, we actually had this crazy night scene that got cut. Uh, you will remember it probably. And that was their our most intense lighting setup. It was insane. <laughs> and then I was like, how oh, are not even using that? <laughs> Uh, but that's how that relationship kind of came about. And then, you know, it, it, it would, it's, there's a lot of trust there, a lot of experience. Um, you know, I never at any point did I, I ever doubt or question or be like, you know, there'd be sometimes where guy would be doing things. And I'm like, I don't know what he's doing over there exactly. And then I would look at the monitor and I'd be like, oh, I understand what you're doing and I'm not going to bug him. Um, <laughs> He's just letting, he's getting this as it unfolds and he's in the right spot, which is just, I'm going <laughs> to just, just going to let him do his thing. Um, you know, honestly, uh, I can't wait till you're in town again or when we can, I, this is just the, to me, the appetizer of a conversation. We, I, you know, I, because of the DGC thing, I wanted to be, have a chance to sort of talk about some of the craft of the director working. And, uh, you know, there's so many, I have so many questions about story and, and script and character arcs and how did you assemble it and your personal connection um, to the material and, and why you chose to make it. And I feel like that might be if we, if, if there's a way of you, you know, expressing that because we're, we have to kind of wrap up here, you know, but a nice closing thing I think would for all of us to hear and inspire us to go see this beautiful film, Wild which is making its premiere at TIFF uh, this year, you know, in this, these coming days. Um, why did you make the film? What was your, your inspiration? Why did you want to go out and make this absolutely stunning, beautiful, engaging, moving, important work? I was bored. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Oh, you're really committed there. Uh, <laughs> you're hired. Um, the this story, I mean, I said before I was working on it for 10 years, you know, I, and I was working on the script for, for 10 years. And to me, it's uh, a large part of it is connected to how I grew up or where I grew up and, and how I was raised. I didn't get the opportunity to, you know, grow up with my language um, or in, in community all the time. Um, so it's something that I've had to work at reconnecting. Um, and learning the language and ceremony and, and kind of being open to teachings uh, from elders, from knowledge keepers, from community members, uh, from little kids, like uh, from from everyone. Everyone has a teaching to share if you um, take the time to sit and, and listen and and understand. Uh, so that that's part of it. And then that kind of informed uh, the relationship. My relationship with the community informed. The shape of this script um, and speaking with family and friends and, and community members really shaped the story uh, and brought it to life. And working with the, the Wabanagi Two Spirit Alliance in particular, um, talking about like Two Spirit identity from an Old New perspective, from a Mi'kmaq perspective, um, and what that means, and like what is Two Spirit and, and what is that to me um, and my understanding. So part of that um, is it's all kind of rooted together. So. I mean, what I'm saying is it's a long answer, but I'll try to be brief. Um, that really, that the story is about kind of finding um, a connection, finding a connection with a community that you belong to, that you're a part of, that has a space for you, um, that you have a function and a role and you have things to, to share as well and, and to give back um, that help the community and, and, and that is good, um, that really, this land where we are, Ulnoegadi, Mi'kma'ki, you know, our traditional territory is governed by peace and friendship treaties. And those treaties aren't about like giving up land or giving up, you know, um, hunting and fishing rights. They're, they're about existing together and how we treat each other. And, you know, those are things that we carry forward even now. Like all, everyone here is a treaty person. You know, we're all 
governed by these things, but so few people understand um, what that means and those relate what those relationships mean and the relationships with the land and the animals and the people and the ceremony and culture. Like those are so rich and alive and important, you know, and I'm tired of seeing movies um, or, or having stories focus only on negative things or hard things. Those are true. Those things are true. Um, but sometimes we need to let go. Sometimes we need to laugh. Sometimes we just need to be together and be quiet. Um, and, you know, that's something that I can, I can picture this in my mind. Like if this film is playing, there's so many people that are there that are just being quiet and listening and, and seeing, and hopefully, um, uh, getting something for themselves, uh, that, that is good for them and, and the people around them, that it brings something like that to them. Um, so that's kind of where it comes from. Uh, no big deal. Uh, <laughs> I, hopefully that, that, that all makes sense. <laughs> well, man, we got to wrap it up and bring Hans. And I just wanted to say to you, brother, you know, thank you so, so much for, you know, making this film and for including me along the way and having me here to speak to you about it. it it's just such an honor to share this moment with you in this little Zoom and, um, you know, hi, hi. Well, yeah, it's, it's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to speak with you and to, and to hear you. Well, thank you. Thank you both so much. I mean, I would have been happy to listen to that conversation for another hour or two. I mean, amazing stories, uh, amazing insight into the process. So thanks, uh, Breton, for the film. Thanks, Shane, for, for teasing it out and, uh, and guiding the conversation. Uh, really fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Breton. I mean, uh, you're coming to Toronto soon for TIFF. Um, you're going to be uh, in a live theater with with live people watching your movie. It's going to be amazing. Uh, something uh, many of us haven't done in a very long time. So really, uh, congratulations on that. Look forward to that. Um, uh, it's going to be wonderful. It's such a beautiful film. So so uh, and and all the best on the, on the full run of the film. Um, to all of you tuning in. Join us uh, this coming Friday, September 10th, uh, for award-winning director Jeffrey St. Jules talking about his latest film, Cinema of Sleep, uh, with groundbreaking director Randall Okita. Invitations will be going out shortly. All visionary sessions are recorded and posted on the DGC National YouTube channel, and they also go out uh, on the DGC podcast. So watch, listen in all the usual places. Uh, these are amazing conversations, important conversations about important work. Um, so check it out there. Uh, Brett and Shane, thank you so much for spending this time with us. So very valuable, so very insightful. And um, to everybody, be well and good night. Thanks a lot. <laughs>